Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. Most of us know very little about bees. We know that some of them can sting, and we have a vague sense that the bee population is in trouble, but that's generally about it. A fascinating new documentary takes us into the world of bees, specifically honeybees, and shows us why they are so important to the well-being of all of us and why they are in so much trouble. The film is called The Pollinators, and its director, Peter Nelson, is my guest. Peter, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming in. Congratulations. It's a beautiful film. Oh, um, so let's get right to it. Why are bees so important to all of us? Well, they pollinate you know, so much of what we eat. There are 400 common crops, fruits, nuts, vegetables. The healthiest stuff that we eat is ho are pollinated by insects, and particularly honeybees. And... and um, why bees specifically as opposed to other uh, insects or birds or butterflies? They can pollinate, right? Sure. Well, bees and flowers have co-evolved and co-evolved uh, through millennia. And so honeybees and other native bees have uh, you know, worked out a, a, a coexistence with a lot of uh, flowers and particularly uh, flowers that turn into fruits and nuts and vegetables. Which a lot of people don't realize. When you say flowers, people sort of think of yeah. you know, flowers that you might have in a bouquet. But, but you're talking about the kind of flowers that um, bloom on things like apple trees yeah. and, and, and other uh, veg fruits and vegetables. Exactly. People don't often think that an almond starts as a flower and turns into a nut, and an apple starts as a flower and turns into a nut. And, and that pollination is essential to get that, um, to achieve that. It just doesn't, it won't become a, a fruit or a nut without that. Right. So you're a beekeeper uh, yourself in upstate New York, and um, you became interested in bees, how? Well, I've been keeping bees for about 30 years, but I was, as a kid, I was very much a free range kid, and I was always interested in nature and what lived in the woods and under this Was this that in rock. New York? Uh, in Connecticut. In Connecticut. Yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when, at a certain point in my early 20s, I got very interested in bees as kind of a hobby. And so I just read a few books and got a package of bees and kind of dove right into it. You've been doing it for decades. What led you to make a film? How did you come to that decision? Yeah, well, I, um, I, have, I have a great passion for bees, but I'm also a cinematographer is my day job. Mm -hmm. and I That's love, how I know you as yeah. a cinematographer. I was actually surprised <laughs> about the bee thing. <laughs> um, and, so, so, and I have a great interest in food and agriculture, and connecting those dots was something I thought, well, you know, I might have a good shot at trying to tell this story. And so that's what really set me on the journey of it. And were there elements of the story that particularly appealed to you that, that, that especially made you think there's a film here? Yeah, it's the, the, the key for me, for me was the commercial migratory beekeepers. And they're an interesting group of people, there's a couple thousand of them across the country, that move massive amounts of bees around the country for agriculture. And agriculture is dependent upon their, this movement of honeybees. And so I got interested in that because it's a story I didn't think that people really knew because it happens at night, it happens usually in remote places, and it's essential to our food system and our agricultural system. And they're just interesting characters. They're fascinating, kind of iconoclastic uh, ranchers, truckers, cowboys, all kind of rolled up in one, and entrepreneurs. And they do this really essential keystone thing in agriculture that most people didn't know. And that was kind of a, an important thing for me because I thought that was a way in to talk about the problems that honeybees are facing and then also the challenges in our food system with it. And I agree, that's one of the most fascinating aspects of the film. So uh, we see there are scenes in the film of these uh, huge tractor trailer trucks with hundreds of beehives, yeah. but of course you can't see them. They're, in, they're inside taking off at night. And um, so we actually have a clip um, that shows a little bit of that. So let's take a look at it. Well, most beekeepers, including ourselves, 
Now, if you're a commercial beekeeper, for the most part, your honeybees are mounted hives are sitting on pallets. They're either four hives on a pallet or six hives on a pallet. And uh, everybody's got forklifts, you know, all trained forklifts, bobcats, swingers, articulated loaders. Most of our, all of our short distance bee moving for pollinating apples and vegetables and so on. That's all done with, with straight trucks and so forth. But now when we start crisscrossing the United States, that's all done with one semi. Most of the public out here has probably seen loads of bees going down the road and didn't even know what they're looking at. This looks like something covered up with a big neck. Most of the bee moving all is done at nighttime. The bees all come home in the evening and come in after dusk. So we wait till the bees are all home and then we go out there and load them and, you know, and send them on their merry way. And so when the semi truck gets to where its destination, there'll be a beekeeper there that's gone, to load that truck and put them out in the almond orchard, the apples, uh, the blueberries or what have you. The farmer basically pays us for bringing the bees in. It depends what the crop is. You know, almonds in California, the going rate right now is anywhere from $165 to $225 a hive. And that's for a period of, you know, five to six weeks while the almond bloom is. So Peter, why do we need these um, commercial beekeeping operations, um, you know, transporting bees back and forth all, all over the country? Why, you know, since ancient times, uh, nature has taken its course. What's changed? Yeah, so, the, so the, they've been moving bees around somewhat for decades. In the last 20, 30, 40 years, it's really accentuated as agriculture has become much more simplified. So there's less diversity in a farm field than there used to be. And so as agriculture becomes simplified and more towards a monoculture, there's not a lot for bees, whether the honeybees or native bees, to live all year round in that environment. And so the necessity of moving these bees around has become you know, a reality. And so if farmers pay for these bees to be brought in, it's almost like an insurance policy to ensure that the pollination occurs so they get a crop. Okay. So um, I mentioned that the bees are in trouble and it's actually very serious uh, trouble. Can you talk about that a, a little bit? There's a number of factors contributing to this. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that these beekeepers face, which is, is, which is kind of startling, is their losses. Their losses are anywhere from 30 to 50 percent, sometimes more, which is really frightening because it's not sustainable. And so the things that bees are facing is not only the, the simplified agriculture um, with the lack of habitat that the bees need, native and honeybees, um, but then the, uh, the effects of pesticides is a big one. There are parasites that are, um, that are really hurting the bees and a big problem of varroa mite is a huge problem for all beekeepers, whether it's a backyard person like me or a, a commercial beekeeper. Um, nutrition, just like us, bees need to have a diverse forage in order to have a healthy immune system. And, um, and habitat loss is a, is a big problem as well. So can you explain um, why the type of farming that's done primarily in the United States now, um, which are the, the big, it's agri agribusiness, you know, big corporations and stuff, um, why that has a negative effect on bee habitats? So almonds is kind of the most glaring example. And almonds, there's about a million acres of almonds out in Central Valley of California. And Which I never knew till I saw this film. <laughs> it's insane. And, and it's, um, the, the problem for bees is that they bloom for about five or six weeks during the year. And the rest of the time, there's nothing there for bees, whether it's honeybees or any other bees, to eat. And so there's no, they, they would starve. They just can't, can't exist there. So they need to bring the bees in, in for that. And so or the, it just becomes a food desert. Right. So you mentioned um, pesticides, a big problem. And over the past few decades, there's actually been some changes in the types of pesticide, pesticides used in this country. Talk about that. Yeah, so the new class of pesticides, they're called neonicotinoids, and it's a systemic pesticide that runs up through the plant itself. And so when an insect, a pest, bites it, they get poisoned. And, but the problem is, is that it also gets in the nectar and in the pollen, and that's where it affects bees really negatively. Um, and the, these pesticides are a lot safer for humans to use as opposed to the organophosphates and the older carbamate pesticides, uh, 
but they, they last a really long time in the environment. They're water soluble, so it creates literally problems downstream. And, and it's just, a, they're used on so many things. They're used almost uh, in a way that is prophylactic. And so they're not looking to find out if there's a pest there. They're treating oftentimes with this pesticide, whether there's a pest there or not. And that's a real problem. And um, do they not understand um, or not care? Um, I, I don't know who to, who to blame or if there's even any blame that applies, but if you take um, the big time farmers or if you take the pesticide manufacturers or, or whatever, um, do they not care about the ultimate impact of the destruction of bees on agriculture? I think that farmers do really care about it, but they really, they're focused on their crop and the crop yield. And so they, a lot of times, it's hard to find some of these seeds, some of these crops without these pesticides on it because the, the control that some of these companies have over the market of seeds. And so I think the farmers do care, but oftentimes if you're growing corn, you may not think that the pesticide on that corn seed is a problem because corn is not pollinated by bees. It's important to note that there are a couple of, not a couple, there are many crops that are, that are not pollinated by insects or birds. They're wind pollinated and they're the big crops like wheat and corn and rice are all those crops. But if they do have the pesticides on them, it still gets in the pollen that bees do eat and use sometimes and it gets on other crops when it's right. dispersed through the wind. So it's a, it's a downstream effect. So it's pretty easy to say if you've got acres and acres, I don't know how the, the terminology is, but if you've got so much corn, uh, it's easy to say it's not my problem. Exactly right, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things, one of the many things that, that were so interesting in the film is that when it comes to pesticides, the European Union has a very different approach than um, the way we do things here in the U.S. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so what the European Union has decided, and in interestingly enough, they just strengthened their regulations this past month um, on pesticide use. They've banned neonicotinoids, and they operate off of what's called a precautionary principle, which is they want to make sure that these pesticides are safe before they use them and put them on, um, on the plants, which sounds very, log <laughs> they sounds very logical. They want to make sure they're yeah, safe. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it sounds reasonable, logical to me. But um, here, the, the, the way pesticides are tested and released is that oftentimes the companies themselves are doing the science and uh, performing the test and the EPA is kind of looking at it and saying, yeah, it's, it's okay, and then we'll try it, the conditional registration. We'll try it and if there's a problem, we'll deal with it. Well, once it's out in the environment, it's already a problem. And if it's not safe, it, I don't think it should be there. Right, uh, that seems like such a uh, typically American approach, almost like a gunslinger approach, you know, shoot first, ask questions later um, kind of thing. Then you pay the consequences. So. Yeah, it's a, there's, a tremendous, uh, uh, there's a tremendous influence of money in this whole deal from the uh, ag chemical companies. So back around, um, I think it was 2005, 2006, there was um, uh, even uh, a more terrible situation uh, with regard to bees than, than we're facing uh, now in this country. What was going on then and why has that problem diminished somewhat? Well, it's, uh, what you're referring to is colony collapse disorder. And that was a thing that happened in 2005, 2006. In fact, Dave Hackenberg, who's in the film, uh, was the guy who sounded the alarm on that. And he went down and saw, he moved his bees, and he went down and he opened up his beehives and there were no bees there. The bees had left for the day out to forage and never came back. And it was hive after hive after hive. And it was a, all over the country this happened. And um, they never determined exactly what it is. But the name colony collapse disorder has sort of become a blanket term for whenever bees die and you have these large losses now and it's kind of it's stuck on there and so it's, what we have now is not colony collapse disorder bees are dying for a lot of other reasons like the, the i mentioned before the pesticides, pesticides and, parasites and right. habitat loss and all those viruses all so it's colony collapse has become kind of an interesting uh name that is stuck on this thing it was a thing but it's not so common now it still happens but not as common now um whatever is killing the bees we're losing like a half, a third to a half of the bee population in the U.S. every year. Yeah. How's that sustainable? Well, it's not. You know, that, that is the problem. I mean, the, what the beekeepers are doing is they're working this kind of magic, if you will, uh, is that they're, they're able to split their hives, take a hive and turn it into two, add a new queen into half of it. And bees have this great ability 
uh, unique ability to raise their population up really quickly. A queen bee can lay in the summer, she can lay 1,500 eggs a day. And so you can, the population naturally swells in the summer and the, uh, the, uh, the, the beekeepers are splitting and, and sort of um, expanding their hives really quickly. And it's not really the best way to, for it to be done but they have to do it in order to cope with the losses. Right, so your film obviously is focused on bees, uh, but you've also mentioned um, that there are other species that, that are suffering that terrible losses too. I mean, you, you're talking, you can talk about birds, you can talk about uh, bats, you can talk about uh, butterflies. Um, what's going on? It's, you know, our ecosystems are so fragile and it's, it's uh, you start taking pieces out of it and you're, I think we're starting to see things really come unraveled. We're all dependent upon other species and insects in particular. And so you start taking out some of these keystone species and decline in the population, then other things collapse. And that's, that is a real problem. It's what terrifies me. Now, one of the points that was um, emphasized by a number of people in your film, um, is that uh, current agricultural uh, practices uh, where um, these enormous farms are, are focused on uh, one crop, it might be uh, corn, it might be soybeans and that sort of thing. They're saying that in the long run, this just is not good. It, it, it's, it's not good for the environment. It's not good for um, uh, the, the fruits and vegetables and other crops, the quality of the crops um, uh, that we need. It's not good for the soil. Um, what's going on, and, and if it's understood that this is not good in the long run, why do we keep doing it? I think agriculture has moved a lot towards efficiency. Efficiency in planting, efficiency in harvesting. It's much easier to plant and harvest one crop every year rather than have a diverse you know, um, integration of different crops in the same field. But mechanically, as well as planting and organizationally. But the thing is that when you, every time you plant one thing, it takes something out of the soil. And that's why historically, you know, our grandparents had had uh, done crop rotation. People had crop rotation because if you add something in through another plant, you, you rebuild the soil and build upon that. Right. And that's something that we've kind of gotten away for. It's much more chemically dependent with adding fertilizers to cover up some of that and uh, add pesticides and herbicides to, to Kind of make it easier. Uh, I thought just from just from reading the literature as a layperson over many years since since I was a kid, I thought that that was just understood that crop rotation uh, was important. That many of the uh, environmental disasters that we faced in the past uh, were the result of a lack of rotation and yeah. diversity and that sort of thing. But the lesson hasn't stuck. Apparently not. You know, I think that <laughs> again, you know, efficiency is the key and and. A lot of uh, uh, big farm operations are focused on yield. How much can we produce per acre? And it's interesting, some of the people that we feature in the film are doing alternative agriculture, sustainable, regenerative agriculture, and their attitude is, how much money can we make per acre? You know, it's all about more, you know, what they can get out of it and build the soil at the same time. It's not about how much they can, uh, they can grow per bushel, but it's how much money they can make per acre. And it's a different way of looking at it, very profit motivated, but it gives different motivations to, to build the soil and do things in a, in a more efficient way. Now, um, much of the good life that so many of us leave, live are, uh, is the result of these agricultural practices that we're talking about. I mean, um, the average consumer is used to being, being able to get fresh fruits and vegetables in almost perfect condition yeah. in the supermarket year round um, at affordable prices and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so the ordinary consumer bears some responsibility. If we bear some responsibility, what are some of the things that we could do that might help to make the situation better? Yeah, so there's there's a lot that people can do, and it's and it's part we we get all get tempted by you know raspberries in New York in the market in February. That's not a normal thing. That's not what it was when, <laughs> I, was, when I was a kid. <laughs> right. You know? And and it's like, but we get used to that. It's the improvements in the efficiency of transportation and things like that. But thinking about how to eat more locally and how to eat more seasonally. You know, it's apple season right now here in New York, and this is the time to be, eat apples. It's not necessarily in February or March, you know. Apples store pretty well. But it's uh, w thinking locally, seasonally is really important. And thinking, just thinking about where your food comes from is so important and part of the answer. Right. 
Um, I have to chuckle every time I think about it. You have to think about lawns, <laughs> big, lush, green lawns that so many homeowners are crazy about. Um, I don't think it's, it's overstating it to say that you hate lawns, but, but yeah. you find lawns to be problematic. Why? Well, the, the, lawns are a monoculture. And you know the, the the idea of a lawn goes back to I don't know English manor or estates or something and home ownership is, is kind of some odd socioeconomic thing, but for a bee it's a food desert. You know, there's one grass species that provides no flower, no pollen, and so a lot of people think, oh, that's a great thing, and they don't like dandelions, they don't like clover, but all that is forage for bees and and butterflies as well. And so I think that we could do a lot for just questioning the lawn, why we want the lawn, and just embracing clover in the lawn or dandelions or things like that. Don't are not obvious to a lot of people, but I think it's like. A really important part of the answer is create more habitat and forage and diverse forage for our, our insects. Right. I think most homeowners just don't give that a thought. They're not aware. You know, they think they probably think they're doing a great thing. Yeah, I, I think so. Along, it's it's right? a funny thing. You've described the overall situation when it comes to bees um, as um, dire but not hopeless. Mm. What did you mean by that? Well, I think that we really need to be concerned because honeybees are a keystone species and they're an indicator species. And so if we have a real problem then, you know, the question is what else is going on in the environment? That's what terrifies me quite a bit. But I think that there are things that we can all do that can make this better. You mentioned lawns and lawns is like a, a pretty simple thing that people could integrate clover into their lawn or do that or create pollinator gardens and they're, they're um, buying local honey. And so I think that, you know, there's something that Everybody who watches this film can do something to make it a little bit better, from uh, you know buying local honey to you know uh, sponsoring or working with their legislators about not spraying herbicides in their towns on the right. side of the road, which people don't think about. It's like you you know they're spraying herbicides on the side of a road to keep weeds down, but weeds are just you know it's a plant with a PR problem in many places, and it's it's forage for a lot of insects, and I think that's important. We need to have that or the populations of the insects are gonna decline and we're gonna have a big problem. And a lot of this stuff is taking place at the local level and even at the community uh, level. Oh, totally, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really important because the federal government right now is not, um, is, they've rolled back regulations about pesticide use. It's, it's, in many ways, I feel it's sort of a company picnic going on in Washington right now. <laughs> But states, importantly, states and local governments are um, are really becoming active in making some pollinator protection policies, and people can really get activated with that. There are so many states that are doing stuff now; they're they're filling in the gap of where federal regulation, you know, has fallen apart. Now, the film is called The Pollinators. Where can potential viewers see it? Yeah, we're going to be screening in New York uh, on the 11th, and then we're also screening nationally in theaters through an organization called Demand Film. And people can re request it in their community and, and it'll bring it into the cinema. And it's a great experience to be able to see a film like this in a community setting with other people. It's just so powerful. So the 11th of November here in New York. Yeah. All right, Peter, thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Take thanks care. for having me. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word. The Muhlenberg County High School Gymnasium in Greenville, Kentucky, is known as the home of the Mustangs, which is the name of the school's sports teams. But as the Washington Post tells us, the gym was recently used to raffle off guns, semi-automatic rifles, handguns, guns with high-capacity magazines, shotguns, and so on. Who thought it would be a good idea in this era of school children traumatized by mass shootings to use a high school gym to auction off some of the deadliest weapons you can imagine. Why the National Rifle Association, of course. The auction was conducted by Friends of NRA, which is the fundraising arm of the NRA Foundation. As one parent noted, they are selling guns on school property where we have active shooter drills. Said another, it was obscene. I'm assuming we're never going to get a real grip on the problem of firearms in America. Nearly half of all men in the U.S. own guns. Since 1968, which was the year that Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. were assassinated, nearly 1.2 million people, men, women, and children, 
have been killed in America by guns, in homicides, suicides, and accidents. 1.2 million. That's nearly three times the total number of Americans killed in all of World War II. This country is awash in oceans of blood from gun violence. And yet we can't even ban the worst of the weapons, the military-style assault weapons designed solely to kill as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time. We should, however, at the very least, try to protect our children from gun violence. It is now common for kids to worry that they might be shot to death inside their schools. Also common are the active shooter drills, like the ones conducted at Muhlenberg High. When you allow the NRA to literally come into the schools to peddle and promote the very tools that are killing and traumatizing so many of our kids, you become a collaborator in this vast national tragedy. That's all for now. See you next time.